always look for food with the Board B quality mark, so you can relax and enjoy it more. On my food trail today, I've come to Kerry to have breakfast with Mike McAuliffe, innovative pig farmer and chief executive of the Truly Irish food brand. We started in 2009. We brought farmers together from all over Ireland. We have about 85 supply members in Truly Irish. And we became very frustrated with the quality of pork goes out that, that represented what we produced on our farms. And we said, it's time to do something about it. We knew we produced very high quality pork to the highest standards and welfare of anywhere in the world. But yet when we went, went outside my gate and our other farmer suppliers gate, we lost control of that. The consumer didn't get what we were producing because, you know, what's done to it, you know, afterwards. So we just went back to the way it was produced when we were children and you know, it's a natural product, and that's what we delivered, and that's what you hear on your plate this morning. Yeah, what have we here on the plate? I'm dying to taste it. So our sausage is one of the healthiest sausages in the marketplace. It's 82% pork. It has no MSG in it, and it's made with oats, which is unusual. Most of it, uh, sausages would be made with wheat-based or rusk. Some competitors out there, it might be only as low as 45%. But you know, when you taste this, you can see and taste the pork in it. And it's very well seasoned and balanced and the flavour is excellent, so it is yes. a really nice product. Sometimes when you cook bacon, there's a white liquid comes out of it. Tell me about that. First of all, we don't have that. That white liquid you're referring to is uh, brine and salt, which is a preservative. Our rasher here finishes up the same as what goes in before it's cooked. Many others, unfortunately, don't. Not too salty either. Yeah. It's a good cure you use. Yeah, we keep the salt level very, very low and we do the same in all the products. So look, let's finish up the breakfast and go and have a look at the farm. OK, Nevin, this is our maternity section where all the piglets are born. What makes it different here is that we've got this innovation called Freedom Farming. It's probably one of the first commercial farms in Europe to go this way. Normally, a sow wouldn't have as much space when they're farming. These sows have twice the space. When sows are farrowing, we have to protect the piglets. So you have different anti-crush bars there so that they will not lie in the piglets. Everything works better, they have a bit more room to move around. And for example, here then, we have these uh, heated plates that are like, for all the world, like a hot water bottle. You know, so they're heated with air to water units, not oil. We try to do best for the environment. One of the things we're feeding here on, on these farms is a seaweed product. Products is extracted from the seaweed. It's called lactose shield. The sow takes it in through her colostrum and through the milk. The pig that takes it in, it reduces the reliance on antibiotics. So like we're looking at ways to eliminate antibiotics totally. By using this natural product, we can increase the shelf life by up to seven days. The meat is actually a pinker color. It's a healthier product. We have been in trials with UCD for a six year period. These papers are validated. It works, it improves the gut of the piglet. The other product we're using is a product called Century Plus. It's another extract from seaweed, and that in turn enhances the quality of the piglet. It's higher in antioxidants. Also, our next step is vitamin D enhanced pork, where we feed vitamin D to the pig. When you eat that meat, it enhances your vitamin D intake. And Michael, the feed that you give the pigs, what's the base of it? It's quite simple, barley, wheat, soya, maize. Pork is high in protein, it's a white meat, it has got a lot of bad press, pork is bad for you, but what it is, is actually the preservatives that are put into that. You're very aware and you're very passionate about the welfare of the animal, which is really, really important for the consumer, for the chef, and also for the animals. Thank you so much for your time, Michael. Yeah. You're welcome, Nevin. 
It's always inspiring to meet farmers like Mike, who are finding innovative ways to improve their product. In his case, by feeding seaweed-based supplements to his pigs. Seaweed has become increasingly fashionable in our diets as well. But in fact, we're simply rediscovering what our ancestors understood well, just how good seaweed is for us. John, how are you? Very good, nice to meet you. Ne Nevin, um, welcome to Dairy Nan. John, I just come from a pig farm, where as part of the diet, the feed the pig seaweed. And I'm very interested to know the history of eating seaweed in Ireland. Well, you've come to the right place because just around the corner here, um, Daniel O'Connell lived. His house is just around this headland here. Um, and he ate one seaweed during Lent, which is the first one I'll show you here today. OK, look more to it. This one you'll be familiar with. This is called nori, or slow corn in Irish, and it's the one that they use for the sushi wraps. We've got seven plants growing one after the other year round on the boulders here. It's completely translucent. It's only one cell thick. And you can see there if you take a, a munch. So this one is up to 37% protein, and it was a vital foodstuff, especially during Lent, when the population weren't allowed to touch meat. So coming up to Easter Sunday, the sea is mad rough. Whatever fish you might have had salted would be running scarce. But right on your doorstep, you've got a tremendous protein source. So they would have boiled this up for an hour or so and served it like super spinach. So John, it's very plentiful here. Absolutely, it's our fastest growing seaweed. It can grow start to finish in around 40 days. And there's actually a townland nearby, just the other side of Derry Nine Harbour here. It's called Cumadlochon, which is the inlet of the Slough Con. So it's one of the few place names in Ireland um, named after a seaweed. So now if we head that direction, I'll show you another one. Great. John, you give cookery classes and tours. We do with seaweeds. We call ourselves Atlantic Irish Seaweed. And uh, my wife, Kerry ann and I, um, we deal with seaweed discovery workshops. So we take them to the shore with low tide, where they identify the seaweeds um, and learn how to harvest them sustainably. And then my wife prepares a meal for them, all made with various different seaweeds. And who goes to the classes? Well, we'd have a wide range. We deal a lot with schools. But then in the tourist season, we'd have a lot of visitors. We'd have We'd also have a lot of locals um, and a lot of chefs, believe it or not. But there's something amazing I'd love you to see here. If we come up along here, this is a shell midden. So we can see here we've got limpets, dogwalks and periwinkles. So this is the evidence of early settlers. This was basically their waste, their dump. This is registered as an archaeological find here on the north side of Abbey Island. And it's been exposed by erosion. The date can be up to 8,000 BC or right up to medieval times. But what it tells us is that the early settlers lived here in the dunes like the rabbits of today. Their food would have been seaweeds, our sea vegetables, shellfish and fish, which is very similar to the modern Japanese diet. The Japanese have the healthiest elderly population on earth. So Nevin, right here we've got a red seaweed called dillusk. It comes from two Irish words, dul ishka, the leaf of the water. Very rich in potassium, in calcium, in B vitamins and vitamin C. It's and how many varieties are around us here? Over 600 seaweeds in Irish waters. They're broken into three groups, the greens, the reds and the browns. And this was done by an Irish scientist in the mid 1850s, by a botanist from Limerick called William Henry Harvey. And are they all edible? In Irish waters, they're all edible. There's a couple you have to be a bit careful of, but it's nothing like mushrooms where you could eat one and keel over. So, we don't want safe that. superfood. There's one last seaweed I'd love to show you. It's got quite remarkable health benefits. And it's this guy here with the paired air bladders called bladderac or fucus fasciculosus. The shoreline is absolutely covered in it. This guy, believe it or not, binds to a really harmful bacteria we all have in our guts called Helicobacter pylori and safely eliminates it from the gut. So it's been recommended by doctors as a, an alternative to coarse antibiotics or whatever if you have ulcerative trouble. So what would you do with this? You can make a tea, throw it in a stew, you can dry it, you can powder it, mill it into flakes, use a baking bread, throw it into a pasta dish, throw it into a casserole. You're the chef, there's no wrong answers. So just use it. There's two products we've been working on that we'd love you to taste. Okay. Seeing as you're here, this one is called Sea Brittle. Look at this. It's made with nuts and seeds and has seaweed flakes in there also. A red seaweed called Dillisk and green seaweed called Sea Lettuce. My wife Carrie Ann's made this. I love it. Sweet and tasty. So yeah. this is a big hit with the school kids, as you might imagine. And this next one, Black Sea Salt, a byproduct 
of the kelp burning industry, which was a huge industry in the 17th century, the kelp ashes were mixed with seawater and then that was boiled up to give salt, which was then used as a preservative. That was the original freezer, if you like. John, it's salting been fish. absolutely fantastic and fascinating. And I know your tours are going to be a great success. Listen, thanks a million Thank for you. visiting, Nevin. Good Thank luck you. to you. Thanks Take so. care. Always look for food with a board B quality mark so you can relax and enjoy it more.